I do hereby make my last will and testament. If I am to be executed and thus cruelly deprived of my existence, I only ask that my remains be transported back to my home planet by my rival Time Lord and Nemesis, he who calls himself the Doctor. The Master! The Doctor flopped onto the floor, sitting cross-legged, and closed his eyes, concentrating hard. An image appeared in his mind's eye. It was indeed his oldest and most bitter rival, the Master, a fellow Time Lord who had spent most of his lives plotting to destroy the Doctor and plunge the cosmos into chaos, his sole ambition being total dominance over all living things. Like all Time Lords, the Master could regenerate twelve times, giving him thirteen lives. Most Time Lords use those lives with wisdom and caution, each life capable of lasting a few thousand years before wearing out and needing to regenerate. The Doctor himself had gone through six previous bodies before his current one, but the Master had used his up a long time ago. Never one to let something as mundane as death cheat him of victory, however, the Master had found a variety of ways to prolong his life, usually involving adding alien genes to his own physical makeup. It had once been suggested that the Doctor and the Master were opposite sides of the same coin. Both Time Lords, both immensely powerful and intelligent, Whereas the Doctor was honest and good, compassionate and caring, the Master was the personification of total evil, malevolent and immoral. Yet now the Master appeared to be in some sort of danger, so fearsome that he was using his last reserves of mental energy to contact the home he had rejected, in an effort to reach out to his greatest enemy. The Doctor could see, projected into his mind, a dark room with a central pillar of bright light in it. Standing erect, almost too erect at the heart of it, was indeed the Master. His saturnine features caught in a grimace of pain, clearly unable to move. The Doctor caught a fleeting glimpse of a raised area totally surrounding the column of light, a group of metallic creatures looking down on the Master. He was clearly their prisoner. A prisoner of the Doctor's other greatest foes. The Daleks. Nasty mutated blobs of living matter existing inside metallic shells, all traces of conscience and morality purged from their existence. They lived to dominate and destroy. Like the Master, they were pure evil. Unlike the Master, this time they seemed to have won. The Doctor heard the familiar metallic grating voice of the creature's leader, their supreme for your crimes against the Daleks, for your deliberate attempts to destroy us and usurp our rightful place as the supreme creatures of the universe, you are sentenced to extermination! The Supreme began listing the Master's crimes against the Daleks, citing various times they had joined forces only for the Master to betray them at the last moment, when it looked as if he was in danger of sacrificing his own being for their cause. Many times before, the Doctor had thought the Master deserved all he got. Yet now, as he saw him immobile, and realised the extent of the Master's humiliation at having to contact the Doctor for help, he felt a great wave of pity for him. They had grown up on Gallifrey together, been to the famous Academy together, and fled their regimented and boring lives for much the same reason, albeit with different intentions. The Doctor's reverie was broken by a sudden chorus of EXTERMINATE from the assembled Daleks, and the Master was hit from all angles by powerful energy weapons, his body contorting and twisting under the heat for a few seconds. Possibly it was just the fading echo of the telepathic message being severed, possibly it was a result of the various chemicals and other artificial life forces the Master had used to survive for so long, but instead of simply falling dead, his body glowed for a nanosecond, and the Doctor could have sworn it turned almost crystalline before vanishing in a rush of light and heat. The link cut off abruptly, and the Doctor found himself now lying on his back, staring up at the dimly lit TARDIS ceiling, his eyes aching with the sudden termination of the projection. The President's voice purred in his head. I think you know what you have to do. 
The first thing the doctor noticed was the smell. Hot metal. It was acrid. It burned at his throat. And there was a sound to accompany it. A flat sizzling like a dying wasp. He couldn't see anything yet. Hello? He called out. It was too dark and too warm to... That was the burning. With all his other senses dulled, it began to overwhelm him, that burning metal. No, behind it something else. Something worse. Burning meat. Overcooked. Spoiled. The lights began to rise. Too slowly, he still couldn't see anything. Except, what was that? A faint blue light in the distance? The light in the room getting brighter now. The doctor could see that by his side there were drills, and there were saws, and there was an ugly electricity generator with cables running out of it towards... what? Something at the other side of the cage. Something which glowed blue, just a little bit, the size of a large eye. Hello? He tried again, louder this time. Don't you worry about Van Staten. I've nothing to do with him. I'm here to help. I'm the doctor. And that blue light shone more fiercely, didn't it? It blazed. And the doctor heard the beginnings of a voice. Hard and rusty, like an old key trying to turn in a lock that hadn't been used for years. Other lights now, too, above the eye. Because it was an eye, wasn't it? Raised on a stalk. Those new lights flashing in time with each hard-fought syllable that came out, as if mocking the creature's efforts to speak. Dark. Dark. The creature managed to say, trying out the word to see how it felt, trying out an old memory. The lights in the cage were getting brighter, and the doctor suddenly wished they could be turned off, as if there'd be safety in the dark, because he knew what the creature was now. And it was impossible. It was impossible. The doctor! The creature spoke again, and it was with greater confidence now. It was a parody of a Dalek. Surely that's what it was. It couldn't be the real thing. The casing was shattered. Cracks had been gouged into it deep and thin in a dozen places. A top section of its dome had been flattened down somehow, its blue glowing eye stalk jutting out from it at an almost apologetic angle. Its arm was snapped like a broken twig, so that the sucker drooped uselessly and pointed towards the floor. The body was held fast with heavy chains, and those electrical cables the doctor could now see, ran all over the Dalek and were attached by giant clips wherever they gained purchase. But the gun stick, the gun stick jerked into life. It pointed at the doctor. It fired again and again and again. And with it the sound of the battle cry. But with something new to it, a hysterical fury the doctor had never heard before. Exterminate! The Dalek shrieked, and it was insane. Oh, it was insane. Exterminate! Exterminate! The Doctor flung himself at the door, hammered against it in panic. Let me out! And still the Dalek was screaming. You are an enemy of the Daleks! You must be destroyed! And still the gun kept firing. And still, still, the Doctor was alive. He turned around. He laughed. He couldn't help it. He laughed. And there was a savagery to it that he didn't know he'd had inside him. Fantastic, he said. Oh, fantastic. Completely powerless. Look at you. How does it feel? He ran at it, and the Dalek instinctively tried to back away. Its chains groaned and held it in place. Get back, it said. Oh, what? The doctor shouted. He shouted right at it, right into its eye stalk. What are you going to do to me? To 
Madame Vestra, I am always the woman. Or at least I should bleed in well hope so. She has a bit of a wandering eye even beneath that heavy veil. A very beautiful, glittering reptilian eye, I might add, but a wandering one all the same. The crimson horror. Blimey, yes. How could I ever forget it? I remember the case well, being as how it was the first time that the mistress, that is Madame Vestra, entrusted me, that is Jenny Flint, with a delicate mission on my own. By then, see, she had enough faith in me to know I wouldn't muck it up, or hoped I wouldn't at any rate. Up until now, it had mostly been the three of us. Me, the mistress, and Strax, but with the mistress very much taking the lead. We've been set up there at number 13, Paternoster Row, for quite a few years, and a very cosy little situation it had become. Madam was the lady of the house, though veiled when outside owing to, well, what she liked to call a striking visage. Strax, who had a striking visage all his own, was cook and butler and made a very dapper example of the London Slavy, I must say, despite his great potato head. And me, I did for Madame Vestra, general housekeeping, lay in the fire and what not. I also did other things but that come rather more under the heading of pleasure than work. When we wasn't at home, we was off having adventures, Madam being what she privately billed herself as the world's only consulting reptile detective. Clients had been thin on the ground to start with, but word had eventually got around that if you had some queer business that needed sorting, if the official channels and the police could provide no succour, then Madam Vastra was your woman or your late Cretaceous reptilian life form whose people had been the original rulers of Earth, if you want to split airs. But the Crimson Aura was a matter quite unlike any other we investigated. It really began with... Oh, oh, hang on, though. No, there was another case. A case that come first. Back in 1888, before old Straxy was with us. And we didn't know it at the time, but it was sort of connected. It was a strange business, all the good ones are, involving some of the highest and some of the lowliest in the land. And it was the case where I first clapped my papers on the doctor, having only heard of him by repute, as it were. So if you've a moment or two to spare, and you're tucked up in bed or by a nice blazing hearth with a glass or three of Madeira, I'll tell you all about it. I'll fill in the bits what I wasn't concerned with in a sort of awfully way, like Conan Doyle does or, or Dickens did or that other one that Madam likes who was a lot odder and always poorly. Your game? Chapter the First City of Dreadful Delights. Being the reminiscences of Miss Jenny Flint, Lady's Maid of Paternoster Row, London. The year 88 furnished us with a series of cases of greater or lesser interest. This is me, you see, coming over all awfully. Spring brought us the matter of Miss Gregory's disgrace and then the business of the man with the manganese teeth while all through the summer we was hard at it on the curious affair of the sentient Battenberg. After these exertions, Madam had been all for a little holiday in Margate when an evening stroll through the streets of Whitechapel changed everything. Outside the pomegranate music hall, or the old pom as we always called it, a bustling, lopsided deer of a place that occupied the corner of Newark Street and Stepney Way, posters was plastered all over the slimy brickwork. One such stood out above all. Cupid's Frolic, a musical mixture with beautiful scenery and charming effects. Miss Florrie Booth, the jolly jacktar, with a little bit of scrimshaw in me end. All Britannia Aptitude Contest at the Pomegranate Halls, every night at eight under the stewardship of Mr Gideon Mortlock. Instead of incarcerating its inmates, 
The TARDIS set them free to explore far and wide, back and forth, through time and space. Right now, it was hurtling on a course towards Westminster Abbey on the bright frost-flowered morning of the 15th of January, 1559. After their tangle with sinister robots and exploding bubble wrap at Kablam, the whole fam favoured a trip into a tech-free era, far enough back to not jeopardise the existence of any close relatives, but somewhere civilised enough to have decent grub and no cesspits to mess up Ryan's new trainers. Graham suggested the coronation of Elizabeth I, as the feast and flooring were bound to be top-notch, and also because his recording of Kate Blanchett's film Elizabeth had clashed with his series-linked Bake Off repeats, so it seemed easier to hop back and watch the real deal, rather than hunt down a DVD. Warping towards its destination, the TARDIS and Graham were both having a wobble. As the Doctor skittered around the console, coaxing the cranky ship back under her control, Graham shared the source of his worries. I know normally we don't bother, but don't you think we should dress up a bit for this? It is a coronation. I don't feel right rocking up in me anorak. That's not an anorak, Graham. It's a sports leisure jacket and you look gorgeous in it. The Doctor's eyes glinted, teasing. Hang on. Is that what you're worried about? That you might catch Liz the first sigh and change the course of history when she falls for you? Nah, he just wants to wear tights and a codpiece, Ryan grinned. She'd definitely fall for me then, Graham winked, instantly turning Ryan's grin into a grimace. She fell for me once, good Queen Bess, the doctor fondly recalled. Wanted to marry me. Then another time she wanted to lop off my head. We've had a few tangles over the years, but I don't think she'll recognise me now. Anyhow, she hasn't met me yet, technically. We shouldn't meet her. Yaz had been imagining the event beyond what outfit to wear. Just think, she's on the brink of becoming queen. She lost her dad, her sister, and now it's all down to her. She's going to be freaking out, trying to stay focused. Like I was getting my police commendation. We should sit at the back and keep a low profile. Not like my folks did to me. Waving wildly, Dad filming on his iPad, blocking the view. It made Yaz blush. It made the Doctor flush with pride and want to watch the footage, or go one better. Aww, we should go back and see that, really freak you out. Yaz smiled, knew she understood as the Doctor went on. This is a tricky time for women, and whatever Lizzie's shortcomings, no one can say that she didn't blaze a trail. So let's keep it classy, at least until the canapes, then we can go crazy. Ah, there we go! At last, the ship stopped shuddering and seemed to sigh as it settled down to land. What was all that about, eh? Maybe the TARDIS is getting nervous too. If her chameleon circuit still worked, she'd be decked out in her best oak panelling and tapestries. Never mind. We'll blend in perfectly like we always do. Let's go grab us a pew with a view. The Doctor led the way, striding out of the TARDIS, into the woods. A clearing in the woods, to be precise, with a carpet of mulchy brown leaves below and a vast white wintry sky above, through the bare tree branches. You have got to be kidding me. Ryan looked down at the black mud seeping up through the rotting leaves, staining his pristine soles. I know London was less built up back then, but surely Westminster wasn't this, um... Graham peered around, searching for the right word. Woody? The Doctor was a tad flummoxed too, until she remembered. St James's Park! Liz's dad, Henry VIII, made it into a deer park for his hunting pleasure. A luscious, boggy oasis, slap bang in the heart of London. She turned 360 degrees, getting her bearings, then apparently guessed. This way! St James's Park? Graham raised an eyebrow, then shrugged. If you say so, Doc.
don't forget to click below and subscribe to the official Doctor Who YouTube channel.